there's warnings in the scripture, and, and we talked some of this about detecting another gospel. There's there's warnings in the scripture about another gospel. That's an explicit statement in there. Another gospel, another Christ, powered by another spirit. Not that these other things are legitimate, but they're different than the true one. They mimic or try to counterfeit the true. These are basic things. A lot of times when you're dealing with people that, that are not in church or have never read the Bible and just had like hand-me-down religion, um, this, this topic is a big surprise. And if you do bring up false gospel, a lot of times people go to, you know, hey, you're talking about Jehovah's Witness, you're talking about Mormons, you're talking about Scientology. Um, they might say Roman Catholicism. But then when you get closer to um, quote unquote Protestantism, people, they back off. You know, they want to put Christianity under Protestantism. And they think basically everything's pretty much safe there. And uh, it's the furthest thing from the truth. So a false gospel, just over the basics again, a false gospel is not used in salvation. God will not do it. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. A false gospel is not. It's not that God um, won't do it. God can't because it's uh, a violation of his own character. He would be a liar. He would be giving faith to somebody to embrace a false gospel. And that would be God deceiving the elect. God sends strong delusion on the non-elect. And um, which which doesn't matter. <laughs> We're talking about the elect, the people that he loves. So God does not use false gospels. And so when you're communicating with people about a false gospel, uh, this is hard to get through their head. That a false gospel won't work. It, you know, God doesn't use it as the power of God into salvation. Uh, some of you probably dealt with some people and, you, and you've seen that that's the case. It's it's just odd to me that it's just like that statement we made in the other the other session that uh, the gospel must be true to qualify as the gospel even in the first place. And so those people that would reject that, you know, they, they need to be given faith by God because I don't think they're believers. So, let's start talking about some of these points, like um, in the Doctrines of Grace, so let's think of all the uh, nicknames for the Doctrines of Grace, Sovereign Grace, Reduct Reluctantly Calvinism, um, some say Reformed Theology, and so don't be fooled by that Reformed Theology because um, other aspects of the Reformation are included. Some may call Lutherans holding Reformed theology, and they don't hold to the doctrines of grace, though. They might hold to the first, the first one, total depravity, because Martin Luther wrote against free will, but not the rest of them. So what else? Um, the acronym that the five points, so-called, is TULIP, the acronym that's used. Most of you are familiar with that. T, it, it, you know, it's an acronym, it, acronym goes down and each letter stands for something. And T is total depravity. And the U is unconditional election. The L is limited atonement. And the I is irresistible grace. And the P is... Some, some people choose one or the other, either preservation of the saints or perseverance of the saints. I don't mind talking about perseverance as long as we don't talk about it in a legalistic lordship way, and, but most Calvinists talk about it that way, which is unfortunate. So the Armenian, and again, let's give synonyms for that. Um, the Armenian would be those that believe in God loves all, Christ died for all, God wants to save all. They would believe in free will. 
they would believe in definitely universal atonement. Christ died for all people, but not all people are saved. And they, some Armenians believe you can lose your salvation, but like the Armenian Baptists, they don't. They believe in eternal security. But those, those Armenian Baptists hold to universal atonement and free will. So that's why we can't put them in the sovereign grace camp. So, I know some people were listening to um, kind of going after some of the uh, legalism of Jim Brown and we're looking on YouTube for some counter arguments and some people do this with Lordship Salvation. They'll find some, some Armenian Baptists that have good material against Lordship Salvation and legalism. And I can, I can tell them pretty quick. Sometimes you gotta you gotta go a little deeper and figure it out, but you know that they're pretty easy to spot. So I, I don't even mess with those people. I don't listen to their stuff. Don't need to really, because they haven't came up with anything any different than what me and Sonny and some of our pastor friends have come up with in defense. Um, so that's kind of dangerous. And, and what's dangerous about it? I mean, if you know who these people are and you listen to privacy your own home and, and you know what to listen for and you're still, you know, it's fine. I would not share their stuff on social media. I would be so afraid that somebody would get a hold of an Armenian Baptist that's talking against Lordship and then start getting into their heresy of free will and universal atonement. So that's the dangerous side of that. Another thing too, say, for example, I think I said this before, if you, if you put sovereign grace in, um, um, Google and search it. There's an official denomination called Sovereign Grace uh, Ministries. And if you can, if some people are looking for churches, they'll look up Sovereign Grace Churches and, and that's what comes up. And it's a, it's a bad denomination. These, we talked about before, and I'm going to try to tie those other, that other message in that we did about like um, spotting a, a, a false gospel. There'll be a little bit of overlap with this false gospel of Arminianism. What I didn't finish saying was the synonyms for Arminianism. So, so I had mentioned um, Augustine and Pelagius back around 400 AD. <clears throat> so some of these, uh, when we talk about the false gospel of Arminianism, there's not much difference in Pelagianism and Arminianism. And some people talk about uh, semi-Pelagianism. But uh, Pelagius went one step further and said that um, you didn't even need the Holy Spirit to come to God. And I think the Armenians, their only difference is they say, no, you do need the Holy Spirit. But I mean, what's it matter? Because they believe in free will. It's not like the Holy Spirit does the work. They're the ones that get the credit with their free will. They're both free willers. So it doesn't matter to me. They're all the same. So when you talk about Arminianism, Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, what we mean is it is a gospel, so-called, that has grace plus works. Um, it is a gospel that has conditions. Uh, in other words, um, contributions, right, from you. You contribute to salvation in some way, and if you don't, it won't get done. See, that's, that's it right there. And same with conditions. If there's conditions and you don't fulfill the conditions, it's not going to get done. Okay, so right away, I think, um, I can't remember if we went to Romans 11, 6. Oh, let's just go there anyway, just as a reminder. Romans 11, 6. See, I did a, I, I've done all the messages without notes so far, so it's not like I wrote something down and I can remember to go back and see what we talked about on paper because I didn't, I didn't um, write notes. So in the context here, Paul's talking about uh, did God get rid of all the Hebrew? You know, there's no Hebrews among the elect. Paul said, "Yeah, of course I'm one." And uh, you know how that God concentrated primarily on the, the Jews in the Old Testament and then the covenant transition and then the new covenant. Here comes a lot of Gentiles. And then, you know, the question is asked, 
So God blow off the Hebrews? He said, no, I'm one. And he starts talking about that. He talks about a remnant, a small bit out of the larger bit. And in verse 5, he says, even so at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So here he's talking about, he's talking about election, which is part of salvation. If you don't have election, you don't have salvation. Election is not all of salvation, but it's part of salvation, which of course happened before the foundation of the world. And, you know, we, we'll talk some time more about unconditional election. And if you need to know more about that, I've got that 51-part series called Chosen in Christ. It's just loaded. Some of the people in the groups um, looked at it. I think Thomas has, might have been through it twice. Uh, but, I mean, it's, there's a lot of material there, about 60 hours. Look at the next verse. So, so what I want to say here is it's, it's talking specifically about election. Now, that's one, again, that's one part of salvation. So if we bring, if we bring it in time when we're talking about, say, regeneration or conversion, which regeneration is, is God the Spirit imparting spiritual life where, where there was deadness there, and then conversion is the gift of faith and repentance. If we're talking about that, this is, this is the part of, um, in Romans 8, where it talks about whom he foreknew, he predestinated, and then he called. That's that part right there, the calling. Then he justified, then he glorified. So the calling part, let's just bring it into the context. This verse here, 5, instead of election of grace, let's say calling of grace. We're allowed doing that in the context because it does perfectly fit. Any part of salvation is of grace. So you could insert any part of salvation where it says of grace. And then the rule applies from verse 6 to all of it. This is safe. This is safe. And if by grace, here he's talking about election. We could say the same thing about, again, calling. Then if by grace, then it is no more of works. That makes sense so far. Here's the implications. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So if it's by grace, it's not of works. Otherwise, in other words, if you would make it works, then grace is no more grace. You've canceled. You've voided out grace when you add works to it. Grace has to be free, um, complete, full and free and sovereign grace. God doing it, not us doing anything to make that work. And then, you know, people would be crafty, creative. Let's, let's think how we can... Uh, get our hands in this somehow. Um, it's a gift, and therefore, what? We we have to open the gift, right? And if we don't open the gift, we can't have the gift, right? <laughs> it's just stuff like that, which is ridiculous. Now, they try to work their hands in it any way that they can. So, <clears throat> so that verse right there, I mean, this this is a good identifier for so many false gospels and Arminianism. Every part of the Armenian false gospel is conditional. It's works plus grace. It's, it's um, works canceling out grace by adding works to grace. Now, what are, the, what are the implications of that? In other words, okay, so first of all, that would allow, um, that would allow people to boast, would allow you to brag. Of course, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that you can't do that. Romans 4 says that too. It's talking about Abraham. Uh, it doesn't work that way with God. It says there in Romans 4 about Abraham. Abraham couldn't take any credit by doing something in the flesh. It talked about God imputing righteousness without works. To him that works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. So there's these stark lines drawn in scripture. You start seeing them, they jump out everywhere. These are the things early on that I started marking up in my Bible, bold and bright. And you start to memorize where they're at. And then you tie them together collectively and you see the harmony in all of them. So 
if you were to make this in reference to calling of grace and then add works to it, what, what would that look like? That would look like free will. That would be taking credit for a decision or some kind of move to, toward God. We know that the scripture said in, in um, let's just go ahead and go to uh, Romans 3 while we're at it. I mean, this is, this is uh, some basic total depravity language here. This is your total depravity, depravity, sort of like your template that you can use in all of Scripture. When it talks about, it talks about two things. It talks about stat, legal status, and it talks about inability. Really, the strength of total depravity is the legal, the legal status, status of condemnation because of Adam, and the fruit of that is the inability. Uh, verse ten, as it is written. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Everybody that comes into the world is born with Adam's sin imputed to them. They are in Adam under law. Now, the Armenian would say they, they would reject that Adam's sin imputed. And the Armenian would say, well, I, I'm not good, but I, I, you know, if I just, if I get a little spark, from the spirit, if I cooperate with spirit, use my free will, then I'll be okay. Uh, and then Pelagians, they're like really wild. Just they, they do pretty much everything, with even without the spirit. So we're in need of a righteousness that answers the demands of God's law and justice. We don't have it by nature. Um, we are legally condemned that's what death is the day you if the day you eat thereof you shall surely die legal death legal condemnation guilt there is none that understands so there is a there's a natural inability of the mind i mean just that verse blows away free will how are you going to have free will if you don't have an understanding you have to have an understanding imparted to you in that spiritual life where God opens your mind and reveals the truth so you can see it. So there's none by nature that understands. And then here's this, here's another layer. There's none that seeks after God. That's a big anti-free will verse. You don't know God, you can't understand, and you don't seek after him. So to come to Christ is only by faith and a person has to be regenerated and given faith so that they can come to Christ. So there's these barriers set up, but false religion seeks to take down these barriers, lower God's standard and raise man's abilities. So these things are right off the bat, they're not good. Verse 12, they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. So there's nobody good. You know, Christ, the uh, rich young ruler, approached him and said something about good master. He says, oh, hold on, ho. Oh. Well, you call me good. There's only one good but God. I don't think the guy caught it. You know, he's, Christ was saying, I'm God. <laughs> anyway, I think the guy thought he was good anyway. So he thought he kept the law. So there's some there's some basics there about like the first point they deny total depravity the 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 false gospel people deny total depravity they don't like the Adam sin imputed for legal guilt and condemnation and then they don't like you talking about their inabilities and when it comes to the next letter in in the doctrines of grace unconditional election the Armenians. And, and those other free willers, the variety of free willers, believe in um, conditional election. And it pretty much goes like this, that God, um, what they consider foreknowledge, which <clears throat> I think they're misidentifying it as omniscience, God knowing everything. But they say that um, God looked down through the future, projected his mind through the corridors of time to see what everybody would do. And um, he chose them based on what he saw they would do. There's a lot of problems with that. 
a lot. Um, let's go to Psalm 14. I mean, we just read, we just read man's inabilities. They, they, they're not going to be able to do what they think God's looking down through the future to see them do, to choose them. They're not able to do it. Look at verse, uh, well, start in verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I've heard some preachers say, because the there is is in italics. The fool has said in his heart, no, God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's where Paul got that in Romans 3. It's a quote from here. Here we go. This, this verse just shoots down the, the uh, false gospel of God looking down through the future to see what people would do. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. <laughs> no. Look at verse 3. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. It's an impossibility. Man doesn't have that ability. Um to seek after God because he doesn't understand. He doesn't even know who God is. It's not going to happen. It's a lie. It's a myth. Free will is a myth. Free will is a myth. While we're at it, God decreed uh, the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. And since we know that, then we can easily say <coughs> with confidence that Adam and Eve didn't have a free will. Even though Adam and Eve were without sin, their will was not free because God had already purposed they're going to sin. And they're going to sin no matter what. If God will see to it that they will sin. I know some people have a problem with that, but that's just the way it is. Adam was created and Eve was created in such a way that they were uh, peccable. They had that potential and ability to sin built in them. Even though they were in a state of innocence, they had not sinned yet. It was God's purpose that they, they would sin. And uh, they did. And when God said, the day that you eat thereof, he was saying, you're gonna you're gonna eat it not if you if you eat of the truth now it's the day you eat of it so they didn't have a free will Christ on the other hand is impeccable perfect um, one person two natures perfect deity sinless humanity it was an impossibility for uh, Christ to be able to sin he could not have sinned he could not have sinned. It was not that he just didn't want to. He couldn't. So, you know, some people say, you know, God can do anything. Can't sin, right? All right, so that, that's a pretty easy one. And uh, I'm not going to teach unconditional election tonight. I mean, it's, it's so you're familiar with it, but I'm just giving you the opposite today. Um, universal atonement. Uh, while we're at it, let's let's look at a few uh, other anti free will verses. Romans nine. I'm sure, most ever. I mean, you never know who among the group is not familiar with these. Romans nine, and it, and plus, it doesn't hurt to go back over stuff for people that are already familiar with it. Um, should try to get these memorized. These. Um, these verses so you can bring them up in a discussion with people. Romans 9 and um, verse 15. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16. So then, it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, 
but of God that shows mercy. So, mercy trumps supposed free will. We already saw man doesn't have the ability to have free will. God has mercy on whom he wants. Let's, one more verse. Let's look at 17. The scripture says to uh, <clears throat> Pharaoh, even for the same purpose I've raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout the, all the earth. Therefore, and he, he gets a little stronger here. Check it out. Therefore, he uh, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And here's the harder part. Pardon the pun. And whom he will, he hardeneth. That's a sovereign act of work of God to harden the non-elect. Let's go to uh, John 1. John chapter 1. Verse 11, he came to his own, speaking of Christ, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, and we know these would be the elect, as many as received him, to them uh, gave he power, I'm trying to think of the other version, let me see what, uh, authority, uh, modern King James says authority. As many as received him, he gave them authority or power to become the children of God to those who believe on his name. Here we go. This is why I brought us here. Verse 13. Who were born. It's not talking about physically. It's talking about spiritually. Who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. I mean, how much clearer can you get? I had also brought up to you guys sometime Recently, I'm pretty sure. I, I talk about it in some of my messages here and there. In Ephesians 1, you don't have to turn there, but I think it's around verse 18, somewhere around there. 16, 18, 19. That it talks about that God works in the elect with the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead to put faith in, in that one. You know, there's regeneration is, is a spiritual resurrection from the spiritual dead state and faith is given then also and it's the same power so I mean this is amazing to me it's the same power that that takes place is the same power it took to rise Christ up from the dead and there are people that want to compete with that with their free will putting their will the power of their will on par with the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Second Timothy. Here's another one. It's, um, I mean, these these are kind of scattered. I mean, if you do specific word searches like uh, "will," some of these you might not get. Um, like that one in Ephesians, it doesn't say anything about the will, but on its face you can see it's it's anti free will all day. 2 Timothy 2, toward the end of the chapter, verse 24, But the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose. Let me go back to the King James a little bit. I kind of like the language better. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. <laughs> Where's your free will? You oppose your, by nature, you oppose yourself. This is the self-righteousness that I always talk about with a defiled conscience. It's, it's our nature. It's the way that seems right unto a man, but it's the way of death. That we think we can do something to gain God's favor by us doing. We're opposing ourselves, we don't even know it. So just, just more pile on that there's no free will. This says, if God peradventure will, will give them repentance, there's a good repentance is a gift verse right here. You just don't uh, repent of your free will. Repentance is a gift as, as just as faith is. Peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and to re that they may recover themselves out of the, the snare or trap of the devil. Notice, who are taken captive by him at his will. So,
So they can't even have free will over Satan. They think they've got free will over God to make some salvation decision. We'll stop there on that, on the free will stuff and move, move back to, um, we've dealt with election. Let's go to, uh, the atonement. Let me say one more thing about, um, the election thing. Just kind of develop that false view a little bit further. Um, you know, this idea of God looking down, they think God looked down through the future to see who would believe, and then he based his choice on what he would see them do. Now, in my Chosen Christ series, I went to great lengths to, to break this down and show really what this was making God look like. Of course, it's it's making God uh, be dependent on the creature, right? And, and God is react, reactionary toward the creature. Which, um, and well, you can already see it violates this, this idea of grace, right? Because you're adding works to grace. God is seeing you do the work and he's looking and he chooses based on seeing you do the work, right? And it's, it's, this is the same definition as Romans eleven six is making grace void. But what this does is it, it makes God, first of all, it makes God, um, it violates his immutability. The fact that God does not change, it violates that. Because it makes God not know, and God has to go find out, and then he knows, which many changed, right? And therefore, he reacts. The other thing it does is it, it makes God take counsel from man. And, and there's all kind of, especially in the Old Testament, you know, who's been his counselor? <laughs> no can't do that. And that's what this view is doing. It's making man counsel God, react to man's work, make God a respecter of persons, right? God says he's not a respecter of persons. It does all that and more. I, I covered even more in my in my series and breaking that down. I took my time and some of you have seen that and it's went into some detail. So, I mean, it is, it's not just wrong as the hillbillies around here say, it's, it's dead wrong. It's wrong, wrong. <laughs> it's bad. Limited atonement and universal atonement. Now, before I was a, some of you may have heard this, me explain this in my message, Calvinists missing the gospel. When I was a Calvinist in, in, in seminary and was not a believer, didn't know the gospel, didn't know Christ, this L in the doctrines of grace, the limited atonement for me was the hardest to um, defend. I, I mean, I didn't know the scriptures that well. I mean, there's no comparison between now and then. Because I didn't, I uh, wasn't into it that much. I was just into it for the fight. You know, I just want to get some information to debate. I was looking at this stuff completely divorced from the gospel because I didn't know the gospel. And all I did is I landed on just some kind of a logical idea, like a numbers thing. Like, um, I was convinced of um, election. So I knew, you know, God had chose a people. And I just thought, that's pretty common sense. God's not stupid. Why would die for more people than he chose? And that's about it. That's about the extent of it. So when I would debate Armenians, I mean, I came across some smart Armenians and, and I, and I kind of got tripped up on this limited atonement thing. Let me say that, uh, some people, when they talk about the doctrines of grace, they say, well, I don't, I don't like that term limited atonement. And all it does is it limits the extent. In, in other words, it limits the amount of people to match those that God chose in election. That's what the limited part is. Doesn't extend it out past those people like the Armenians and the Pelagians do. But some some people that hold the doctrines of grace say they they like other terms better, and, and and I agree. It just doesn't fit the acronym, right? It's not as easy to remember the tulip thing. But um, some like to use um, particular redemption, referring to a particular people. That Christ redeemed. So that's a, that's a phrase, particular redemption. Um, therefore, while early in my conversion, 
uh, I like to use the phrase effectual redemption or effectual atonement, either one. And um, that, that word is not used that much. You know, the common word is effective, same thing. Some people use the phrase efficacious. Um, so, and, and those words are used in other contexts, like you talk about um, maybe some supplements, natural supplements. Uh, you get what you pay for. You can go to the dollar store and get some junk. Or you can go to a high quality store and you can read all the, the different uh, stamps on there of these things you look for, you know, non GMO, this, that, and the other. And uh, it's real high quality and talks about their processing. And <laughs> it was pretty cool. And on a, I should have saved it years ago. There's a bottle on the back. It said something about. Um, it tied the idea of what you pay for in reference to how efficacious it is. And we can say the same thing about the atonement. I mean, it, it's efficacious, and Christ got what he paid for. And in universal atonement, he didn't. He supposedly redeemed all, but didn't save all. God loved all, couldn't save all. Christ paid for all. Christ had all sins imputed to him. There's a lot of things went wrong there because the majority of people end up in hell. And of course, that's not that's not good news, right? All the all these counterpoints, the Arminian points, the free will points, the Pelagian points, the conditional points, all of them, grace plus works points, all of them end up making the message bad news. Right. So when we when we looked at total depravity, we saw men lie about their abilities. They're making God a liar because God, we just read all the verses. They're saying God's lying about what we read. And then election, you know, what, what does that make God look like? Chasing his tail, trying to keep up with, you know, play catch up. And in condition of salvation and what he sees them do, and he's getting counsel and he's changing and he's respecter of persons. It perverts the character of God, false God. And then in this atonement, which by the way, this should be, so here's the deal. On the atonement, when I was a lost Calvinist, it was my hardest point. Now it's my strongest point. This is, this is what I go for first. This is what I call when you're dealing with somebody and, and you see them really push on the universal atonement, universal love, free will, God's trying to save everybody. I go for this juggler right here, the atonement. This is where it's at. That's the heart of the gospel. This is the center of everything, is the death of Christ, the work of Christ. In John 10, if you want to turn there, this is one of the most explicit uh, statements in the whole Bible that is very clear about Christ only dying for the elect. Um, I can't remember which verse where this starts. Um, let's go to 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine, in other words, of my sheep, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down, there it is, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, <laughs> I've heard some slick Arminians say, I think it was Leighton Flowers, um, heretic. I heard him say, and, and, a, and a guy I debated too, um, the only debate I was ever in, public debate, was on the atonement. It's back in 2004. And I think he brought this up. It says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And he was saying, his point was, that's not saying that he didn't die for the goats also. He was saying that. So he tried to defeat the argument that way. And it's pretty silly. I don't even think he used goats. I think the battle was trying to identify who sheep were. But anyway, let's read the rest of it. And we'll see this come to light here a little bit more clearly where we can eliminate the other people. 
Christ does in this conversation. Other sheep have I that are not of this fold. Them I must bring. He's referring to the Gentiles. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, one shepherd. Jews and Gentiles come together, as it says in Ephesians 2, one new man. The middle wall partition is broken down, that hostility between the Jews and Gentiles. The mystery that was hidden from the foundation of the world, that the, the Gentiles would come in and be part of God's people, all that. Um, that's what this is talking about. Therefore, of uh, 17, therefore... Does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again? No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This is a commandment I receive from my father. And then it talks about these guys who, you know, the people are complaining. Let's go on down here. Verse 25. And Jesus answered him, I told you, and you believe not. And the works that I do, I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. But you believe not. Here we go. Because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep are my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then the he's real popular verse, verse here about eternal security. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. 26. You believe not because you are not of my sheep. So it's separated peoples here. I laid down my life for the sheep. You're not my sheep. So that little clownish uh, little argument saying the upper, upper verse over there didn't exclude the other people. This verse does. It excludes the other people. So this obviously talk is talking about those that are remaining are the goats. We see in Matthew 25, it talks about the sheep and the goats being separated. So that's, that's pretty clear. That's pretty explicit. And notice just the way that it's mentioned in 26 here uh, uh, concerning faith. You, you don't believe because you're not in my sheep. So there's an inability there to even believe. And those that believe are identified as sheep. We've talked about before the inability of man, John chapter 6. John chapter 5, I think it is, says, uh, You will not come to me that you may have life, talking to the religious people. And some people say, See, these people just weren't willing. Then you go to the next chapter, 644, no man can come to me except or unless the father which sent me draw him and I'll raise him up at the last day. So there is a, there, that verse 44 is, it emphasizes the stronger point. It's not that they won't, they can't. And the can't drives the won't. So even the, the soft peddling uh, Calminian, they don't even like John 6, 44. They, they, they'd rather look at John 5, the one where it says, I think it's 5, that you will not come to me that you may have life. They'll say, see, they're not willing. All you got to do is you, you can repent. It's just that you won't. Tim Conway from I'll Be Honest, which is a misnomer, um, false ministry, that's what he said. He did a whole message that you can repent, you just won't. And he claims to believe the doctrines of grace. This is what we're dealing with today, people like this. You know, Calminians, is, which is one of the nicknames, um, it's false. So the atonement, when we come to the atonement, I think what we need to see what's best to look at is not... We're not just answering, like, how many people did Christ die for? Who did he die for? No, it is whoever he died for, whether it's one or a million or a trillion or whoever, those that he died for, whoever that was, then we know that's the elect. The question is, what did that death accomplish? That's the gospel question, right? We, I think we've talked about before how that, uh, I think in one of those other messages, we went to 1 Corinthians 15, one through four, and it, and it talked about just the history, right? 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ said was the gospel according is said according to the scripture, which of course gives more detail. But it's not just it's not just the history of this one that did this thing. It's what did that thing accomplish by the one that did it. That's the gospel. That's where you get to the gospel. Wherein the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, I just quoted that verse in Romans 1.17. You know, 16, <clears throat> the power of God, the gospel is the power of God and salvation. Chapter 1 that believes. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And this is talking about this righteousness. Christ came to establish by obeying the law and paying the penalty for the broken law. And that's him establishing or bringing in or working out a righteousness. And then that merit is that gift package is secured. And then later in each elect's lifetime, and even previous to that in, in the Old Testament saints, is transferred to their account, reckoned to their account, credited to their account, legally transferred to their account, imputed to their account. That's the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. That's what makes the gospel the power of God and the salvation. Without that idea, with that, that doctrine in it of, of Christ's righteousness established and imputed, you have no gospel. It's what makes it the power of God and the salvation. And there are, there are whole ministries that, that speak nothing of it. And some of you have been in those ministries. So again, what did that death accomplish? And then... What was the effect of that accomplishment? Not just our salvation, but connected to God. God can now be a just God and a Savior when he justifies based on that righteousness, which was accomplished, um, crafted, or created by Christ's work. He's the creator, by the way. As he merited this gift, it enabled God to be just when he justifies. He does this in a faithful way. He doesn't cheat. It's based on real value the blood and righteousness of Christ. I, I've said this kind of jokingly in messages before, just to prove a point. You know, it's not like, um, I mean, first of all, we know that the, that the cross was violent. <laughs> I mean, there was wrath involved. It's a serious matter. And, you know, Christ, remember in the garden, he was praying, he started sweating great drops of blood. He knew what was going to be happening pretty soon. And so, we believe in the absolute sovereignty of God, but not to the expense of his faithfulness to himself and his law and justice being satisfied. And it's not like, uh, you know, I, I would imagine some people have conjectured in their mind, hey, I wonder if God is so sovereign that uh, maybe this happened, we just don't know, that he kind of went off the side and said, hey, Christ, we're going to, yeah, we'll, I'll take care of this, don't worry. We'll, we'll make this look like I'm doing this to you, my wrath poured out on you, and we'll pretend, we'll play like, and then you know, I'll give you the signal and you can say it's finished, we'll be done. No, no, no. Wrath without mercy until, until wrath was satisfied. God's law and justice was satisfied. I mean, this is, this is what glorified the Father. This is why Christ did this. So, that's the atonement. And, you know, I, I, I hate to stop at any of these points because we could go on forever. Irresistible grace. Well, let me, let me just talk about some implications of universal atonement. I have a, I have a whiteboard video on that. It's short, maybe 15, 18 minutes. Um, implications of universal atonement. It's in the playlist, the whiteboard playlist on my YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. It would be very helpful if you haven't seen it. But I lay out just a few implications of like, what would this look like? Because uh, you have a, we talk about theological terms, and this is how I dealt with the debate with the Church of Christ guy back in 2004. I, I looked at this debate in reference to the attributes of God. You know, what does this, what does a universal atonement make the attributes of God look like? It makes him look bad. And so when we look at universal atonement, the Armenian Pelagian uh, free will view, um, he died for all and, and not all made it. Most will be in hell. Um, so we know that we can boldly, I'll boldly and gladly say that is an idol. I am not afraid to use strong language against that false god. I'm not one bit worried about it. Um, if um, 
you know, somebody, I, I was talking to, uh, hypothetically, people have asked me, hypothetically, what if you find out you're wrong about, you know, about this sovereign grace? What if you find out you're wrong? And usually I think about the atonement when I think about these things. Like, what if I, what if I somehow found out, I mean, it's, it's just a scenario, hypothetical, I, it's an impossibility in my mind, but what if we found out that Christ did die for everybody and most of them went to hell? Well, I'm going to hell. <laughs> I tell you that right now, because I'm done. I quit. That I, I will not worship that God. I would still say he's a false God. I have nowhere else to go but right here. Just like Peter said, when Christ said, are you going to go away? So whom else can I go? You have the words of life. In other words, this, I mean, this is it right here. There's nowhere else to go. This is the truth. And we should have that. We, I'm not going to try to talk you into a bold assurance. We should have this by seeing the scripture. Um, really, human beings are more stronger than that false God. If they have free will and God wants to save them and they won't let him, I mean, come on. It's pretty much common sense. But there's not much left of that, especially in spiritual darkness. There is zero spiritual sense. The natural man receives not the things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned. So there's none that understandeth. So they can't, they can't, they have no life to get a grip on that. <coughs> so it, uh, it, it makes God, you could go through all the attributes. It makes him unjust, right? Because it makes him unjust to Christ, because Christ paid for people's sins, and then these people go to hell, and Christ is like, hey, I, 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 I paid for these people. How come I can't? They're not saved, not paid for them, right? And then it, it screws those people over that Christ died for, because then they have to go to hell, and they're being punished for their sins, and it's like, it's double jeopardy thing. So, um, it, it perverts the love of God. God loves people and he doesn't have the power to save them. They end up going to hell. I mean, every, it twists up everything. Holiness, righteousness, justice, his faithfulness. It's a mess. We could go on and on. That'd be a good series too, is take all the attributes and run them through universal atonement and show what they do. That'd be a good series. Irresistible grace. We're just clicking past a few minutes past an hour. Irresistible grace. So the doctrines of grace says that, you know, the, the spirit comes and imparts spiritual life. This is regeneration. And after that happens, I mean, it's too late, right? It is too late. This happens to us. There's nothing we do to bring it on. This is the new birth that's spoken of in John <coughs> John 3 as he was talking to Nicodemus. It's like the wind. You, you don't know where it's going, where it came from. You can hear it. And he said it's similar to being born of the Spirit. Now we know that God's gospel is used in regeneration. The Spirit borns one again with, it says in John uh, 118 with the word of truth which is means um, so and then there is then there is immediately the gift of faith this is called conversion faith and repentance is given so regeneration faith and repentance and by then it's like this is a work of God so it's like it's it's not you doing it it's not even you cooperating it it happens and then the just shall live by faith after that point the rest of their life. So you look at the free will side, of course, free will interrupts that. The Arminian view interrupts that. And it has man having the power to stop that, resist that, which makes man sovereign and not God. And it would make God an idol. I mean... When we're on this side of it, <clears throat> trying to think back what we used to hold to, it's, it's, for me, it was a long time ago. And, and plus I was a lost Calvinist for four and a half years. Be, before that, I, I kind of didn't even care. 
I was so ignorant. I mean, I was just a social thing. <coughs> My parents brought me to um, church. It was social. I knew I knew some scripture and stuff, but you know all the Old Testament stories and stuff. But I was way ignorant. But try to, in other words, what I'm saying is everybody try to think back. Um, I would be interested in some in the group, like if they were like a free willer, like maybe just a few years ago. It would be easy to ask those people, like, do you remember what you were thinking? You know, um, I made my first false profession at 12 and I went down the aisle and repeated a prayer. I wasn't thinking much of free will, but I mean, I was... I was playing that out by my conditional prayer to earn salvation. But if somebody would have started probing me about free will, uh, I don't know what I would have said. Not much, probably. I just would have just said, well, I know what I did. And the Bible says if I did that, this is what I get. And that's how, that's how bad off I was when I was 12. Um, so... Everything's the opposite in the Armenian side. Grace is resistible. You take credit for all your moves, even if it's cooperating with the Spirit. You're still taking credit. You remember the publican and the Pharisee, they went and they, they prayed, and the um, Pharisee stood and prayed, said, Scripture said he prayed thus with himself, and then the publican stood afar off, and um, he looked down and he beat his breast and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the, but the Pharisee, if you remember, he said, um, in his prayer, he said, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And what was, he, <laughs> you see that little religious movie? He was trying to give credit to God. Use God's name. I thank you that I'm not like that guy over there, right? So that would be a cooperative thing. I'm doing these things, he's saying, and I thank you that you're, you know, um, uh, enabling grace. They, that's the idea <coughs> of modern day evangelical enabling grace, which is synergism. That's cooperation, which means if you don't cooperate, it's not going to get done. What's that mean? Works. <laughs> Conditions. Grace plus works. Contributions. I'm going to start using that word, I think. I use conditions a lot. I need to mix it up. Contributions. You should probably just get a thesaurus and just make a big list and start, start bringing in some new language, some other synonyms, keep it fresh. That's a, that's a pretty easy one is, um, irresistible grace is really the opposite of free will. And then the last one is, we could talk about in two ways, perseverance or preservation. Preservation would be synonymous with eternal security. And I know some of the Armenian Baptists, the free will type Baptists, like to talk about once saved, always saved. They've kind of hijacked that phrase. I mean, it's a true phrase, but usually when you hear that once saved, always saved, and then they, they use that in an acronym. Um... It's this kind that's tied to easy believism of people walking down the aisle, saying a prayer, getting their ticket punched, <coughs> and they're done. They don't ever go back to church, don't read their Bible, don't pray. They did their thing and they got their ticket. And that's all they you know, that's all they that's all they care about. So um, that's not the preservation we're talking about. We're talking about that the Holy Spirit seals we just read the promises in um, John 10 about no man's able to pluck them out of Father's hands. So that's the idea of eternal security. Eternal security has a ground. It's the atonement, right? If the atonement takes place and the spirit regenerates, the spirit seals, the ground upon which people are held is of course, the promises and the purpose of God, but the atonement is what's <laughs> is what's purchased them, and Christ is guaranteed to, to have His people. 
They'll be raised up on the last day. It's a promise. So you could look at eternal security in, in several different angles and aspects. And, um, but the ground is the atonement. So you've got these Armenian Baptists, these free will Baptists, that do their easy believism with their altar call and all that. And um, they say they believe in eternal security. But they have no right to. Because how can anybody be secure if you have an atonement that was for all people without exception and most of those people went to hell? How can anybody be assured to be saved if, if most people weren't? <laughs> right? And, you know, what they do is they answer, and their answer gives themselves away because it brings it back on the free will of what they did. Right? To them, it's not the death of Christ. It's what you do with it. Right? So preservation, I'm going to talk about preservation in, or I'm sorry, perseverance, I'm sorry. We can talk about um, preservation in the Armenian way, and then in the Sovereign Grace way, I'm going to make a warning about one of the two ways that people will talk about it. So the Armenian that believes you can lose your salvation there's no guarantee that he will persevere. They might have uh, most of their people that uh, get saved uh, apostatize, leave the faith. Of course, they have the free will to do that according to the... <clears throat> they came to Christ by free will. They can leave Christ by free will. Now, see, the Armenian Baptists won't say that. They say that's impossible. And they'll call... Losing your salvation of false gospel, but, which it is, but that doesn't mean the Armenian Baptists have any ground to really say anything. Their gospel is just as bad. But so that's a that's an obvious false gospel. If you say that, and this is one of the easiest false gospels to show, any denomination that says that you can lose your salvation. I mean, there are a lot of the majority of denominations believe that, right? Roman Catholicism believes that. Uh, as far as the cults, I would imagine all the cults hold to that too. But, um, um, I mean, to just start naming them, you know, Methodist, Nazarene, Church of God, Assembly of God, Pentecostal. Um, pretty much all the, all the Armenian Protestant denominations. And then you, the only ones that don't hold to it is uh, some Presbyterians and Reformed. Uh, Lutherans believe you can lose your salvation, believe it or not. But some of the Presbyterians and some of the other Reformed groups and uh, Baptists, and I would imagine some non-denominational believe you can uh, you can't lose your salvation. But the vast majority believe you can lose your salvation. They believe the Armenian Pelagian view. So what is that? What's that look like? Well, I don't know if you've ever um, asked somebody that says that you can lose your salvation. Ask them, well, how do you lose it? You know, that's a surprise question. A lot of people, a lot of them don't know. So you got to help them out. You got to say, well, is it some kind of sin? You know, and it's, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I never thought about that. <laughs> Give them that. Give them that question. Maybe give them that answer, and, and it's yes. It's always yes. It's some kind of sin. It's either a certain kind of sin or a certain amounts of sins. Right? You do too many wrong things too many times, you're done. Um, so that's the idea. Sin causes you to lose your salvation, according to them. Now we can define sin as the Scripture does define sin as transgression of the law. So that implies that. You have to, after you're saved, you have to maintain salvation through law keeping. And when you violate whatever sins and whatever denomination says that you violate of that law, you lose your salvation. That's an easy, conditional salvation based on the deeds of the law. Easiest false gospel to spot. Low hanging fruit, big time. So now on the sovereign grace side, the Calvinist side, the uh, Reformed side, that believes that you won't lose your salvation. Talking about perseverance. Perseverance. Now, when we teach perseverance at our church, 
we'll go to um, let's go to let's go to Colossians one. It's probably my favorite one to use to prove this. Some of you uh, have been through our Colossians series, and some have been through it more than once, which I appreciate. I appreciate the fact that you appreciate the messages. Um, Colossians 1 and verse 21. And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, and this can be works of immorality or works of self-righteousness. It could be either or both. Yet now hath he reconciled. How did that happen? Verse 22. In the body of his flesh, through death, and what did that do? To present you three things. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That's the good news of the gospel right there. And then verse 23. If... This is not conditional. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of what? Your good works? Your perseverance and good works? Your conditions? Obeying the commands? Hope of the gospel. That's where... That's what a person perseveres in. You see the language? If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. This is just like evidence of like who the elect are. They, they continue in the faith. It's not a condition. It's just evidence of how it plays out and it shows and identifies, makes, makes manifest who the elect are by their persevering in the gospel. Continuing in the faith, grounded and settled, not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. So that's the way I teach uh, perseverance, perseverance in the gospel. Now, good works is another discussion, and, and we, we teach good works after salvation, and we teach it way different than most of um, all other groups and cliques and clubs and denominations. But there is a certain amount of works that people persevere in and those that were set aside by God, it said in Ephesians 2.10, that were set aside for them to do, to walk in, those will be the works that will be persevered in. It's going to happen. God's doing the work anyway. Now, the legalists, the lordshippers, the conditionalists, those that... Um, have you doing things after you're, after you're saved to maintain your salvation and scare you to death and won't give you assurance and keep you in fear, keep you walking on eggshells? Yeah, Thomas, that's a good one. Jude 24, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the throne. I just touched it and just went up. <laughs> Uh, that's a good verse too. I've, I've used that before for defending. Um, that's that matches with that Colossians one twenty two that it presents you holy, unblameable, unreprovable. That same verse that Thomas put up matches that perfectly. But the the legalist amongst the Calvinist sovereign grace reform people, the legalists, the Lordshippers, will look at perseverance. And not necessarily focus on the gospel that much, but they'll focus on this idea of progressive sanctification based on your works will get better and better. You'll do more, you'll sin less, and you become more holy by these things you do. And uh, when people don't see that happen, they'll start accusing you of not growing in godliness, not growing in holiness, and they'll, they'll issue threats. And everybody, um, and some of you guys experienced that in the Jim Brown uh, cult, where everybody was scared to death. Nobody had assurance. And uh, it's a mess. It's evil. It's wicked. And so that's another way to talk about perseverance. And, and I tell you what, the more I talk to people a lot and I read historical stuff about 
quote unquote Calvinism. It, Calvinism gets a bad rap, and probably rightly so, because of that view. You know, you hear a lot of people say, you know, any any Calvinist I ever heard talk that they don't ever have assurance. And I'm thinking, yeah, if it's the if it's these lordship type, you know, uh, these legalist type, yeah, obviously. I mean, who would? So that's why I've shied away from the label Calvinist. You know, not just because it's named after a sinful man, John Calvin. All men are sinful men. Not just because it's named. The truth shouldn't be named after a person, <laughs> not a not a sinner. <clears throat> but the bad rap that it gets. <coughs> with um, lack of assurance, like these people. I, I mean, I hear a lot. I hear it more and more as time goes on. I don't know if you guys ever heard that. All right, so there's there's the doctrines of grace as contrasted with the the opposite five points. And uh, like I said, we just barely scratched the surface. I didn't even look at these notes here. Um. There's some, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here that would be related to what we talked about tonight. And we, I'm not going to withhold it from you. I mean, we'll, we'll talk some more about some of this stuff. Um, I, and I'll make a decision whether or not to um, continue with part two of this with this other. Or, um, I think this is the fourth part. So I really didn't have anything playing. I know some people had been sending me uh, some suggestions and stuff. Talked to Jan on the phone, and um, Thomas sent me an idea about sort of like cause and effect, legal driving the spiritual, and, and so on. I'm going to plan on um, looking at this and tie it to what we just talked about. And there's some good stuff in here that will be helpful to, you'll see. I forgot how voluminous that is. I got. I need to get busy on that. 